So tonight, our meeting is Is It Jade or Is It Pseudo Jade by Eric Hoffman. Eric Hoffman is an aerospace engineer who spent his career at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory and retired as chief en engineer of the space department. He has been studying, collecting, and selling Asian arts and antiques with a focus on jades and snuff bottles for over 40 years. And he can tell you about his website where he does sell these items. He is a jade consultant to the Chinese Cultural Relics Association and a contributing editor to Adornment Magazine on Asian subjects. He is a member of the worldwide organization Friends of Jade and the Association for the Study of Jewelry and Related Arts and has written many articles and reviews on the subject of jade. Most recently, he co-authored two chapters in the book, Jade, A Gemologist's Guide, that's due out this spring. It's possible that it's been published, but he can tell us more about that too. Uh, Eric's presentation will review the characteristics of true jade, both nephrite and jadeite, and then focus on the many lookalikes, treatments, and alterations. Few gemstones are imitated as often and as deceptively as jade, which I love jadeite. He will explain a few simple tests to defend yourself against fake jade using equipment that you already have. So please welcome Eric Hoffman. Okay, thank you, Melanie. Uh, am I coming through on the audio? Yes, you are. Yes. Okay, good. Thank you and thank uh, Charlie and the whole DCGIA for inviting me to talk about my favorite subject and uh, my favorite stone. Uh, we'll take a look at what jade is um, and most important, what jade is not. Um, we'll talk about what makes it special, its unique uh, characteristics, a little bit about where it's found around the world, but most of the focus will be on uh, how to defend yourself against the many jade lookalikes and uh, treatments. Uh, when you think of jade, you think of uh, China. Uh, when you think of China, you think of jade, but in fact, there have been many cultures around the world uh, that have recognized the remarkable properties of jade and uh, either use it or worship it or both. When we think of jade, we think of it as a uh, semi-precious stone, but not quite up there with diamonds and uh, rubies and sapphires and emeralds, but in fact, uh, it can be quite valuable on a per carat basis. Uh, the very top jadeite, uh, sometimes going for 3 million and more uh, per carat, up there kind of with uh, red diamonds in rarity and price. Now, this is probably a good point to mention that Jade is not normally sold by the carrot, but rather by the stone. My all-time favorite example is this incredible necklace, uh, the Barbara Hutton jadeite necklace, which was um, sold at auction in 2014 for $27 million. If you, if you count the beads in it, you'll see there are exactly 27 beads. So we're talking about a million dollars per bead in, in those year prices. You'll have to bring all these prices forward into today's prices using uh, your favorite inflation factor. <clears throat> this particular necklace was created by Cartier in the 30s, and it was um, presented as a, as a wedding present to Barbara Hutton by her father in uh, 1933. And then at auction in 2014, it was bought back by Cartier, so it's now in their uh, archive. It's not clear where these beads came from. Uh, they must have been imperial uh, beads at one point, but somehow they appeared on the scene somewhere around 
somewhere between 1890 and 1910. All right, well, what is jade? Well, jade is actually a rock, which means it's a combination of minerals. And it's actually two different stones. Um, as gemologist uh, Richard Hughes uh, once pointed out, jade is the only uh, gemstone where you have two different stones going under the same name. One is nephrite, as shown on the left, and the other is jadeite, which is chemically different, but the two of the uh, stones are similar enough in their, in their properties that they're both called jade. In particular, nephrite on the left is made up of uh, felted or highly compressed and compacted fibers all interlocked together, which makes it extremely tough. That is hard to break. And in fact, it is it's the toughest of all the gemstones. Complicating things uh, more recently is the idea of omphacite jade, uh, which has uh, come on the scene in the past several years. Omphacite is particularly rich in uh, iron, and it's very difficult to distinguish omphacite from jadeite. So when we take a look at the two types of jade, it's, it might pay to think of it as pyroxene and amphibole jade. And in the pyroxene, we have jadeite and omphacite, and in the amphibole, the nephrite jade. Here's one way to look at it, and this gives the more modern way of looking at it uh, with jadeite and omphacite uh, classified as Feitsui jade and nephrite uh, up the top as true jade, that is the jade that the Chinese carved for 8,000 years. You can see on the uh, triangular chart down below uh, the chemistry, how it changes between jadeite and omphacite getting richer in iron with the omphacite. And then cosmochlor, which at one time was called chloromelanite, a very rich, dark uh, green, almost black. This is what <clears throat> nephrite looks like in its native uh, state. Uh, these are alluvial or waterborne um, pebbles or cobbles of nephrite, which tumble down the uh, streams from the mountains in uh, Xinjiang province in the west of China. And these are fished out of the, uh, the river and car either carved or made into fondling stones. Nephrite uh, can occur in some pretty large pieces uh, as seen by these uh, green examples from British Columbia, Kirk Makepeace uh, is handling these. And we're talking about multi-ton examples such as this one, uh, the Polar Pride Jade Boulder. You're only seeing half of it here where it's been half sawn through and half uh, broken off. Jade comes from uh, many regions of the world, including Russia. Um, now this Russian jade probably came in a hundred years ago. So it bypasses the GIA letter that we just heard at the beginning. Uh, this particular uh, example of a, a picture frame was made by uh, Fabergé. And it shows the typical kind of Russian jade that comes in from the Lake Baikal region of Russia, kind of north of uh, Inner Mongolia. Because of jade's toughness, it can be carved very fine without breaking it. Here's an example of what can be done with nephrite. This, all this open work exists on actually three different levels and um, this can all be done using the most 
primitive tools and without breaking the jade because of its toughness. The toughness also allows uh, chains of jade to be made. Uh, here's a nice example from the uh, Shadell collection, but there are even examples where the chain reaches down inside the vase and connects inside the vase and then reaches outside and connects again on the outside. So nep nephrite can be used for jewelry. Uh, in the upper left, you see an example, actually just of uh, nephrite pebbles where a little bit of the outer skin has been uh, ground off and made into a bracelet. And over on the right, uh, some very simple nephrite jewelry. That, that ring, that Juan ring might actually be uh, quite ancient. There's not much to go on there. The more likely <clears throat> nephrite jewelry that you're um, uh, probably going to encounter will look something like one of these. These are all nephrite jade. And over on the left and uh, in the center, this region, that is Taiwan jade, which was found in the eastern part of Taiwan in the late 60s. By the early 70s, it was all mined out. So the very highest quality of it is uh, found now only in old stock. This on the right is probably Russian jade. It has kind of the Siberian look to it. Moving now to jadeite, uh, the first thing you notice with jadeite is a much more interesting and brighter uh, palette of colors. The, uh, the brown and reddish brown and russet tones up at the top generally come from the underskin just under the outer rind of the cobble. Uh, the green, the colorant for green is chromium, uh, just like it is for um, emerald. The colorant for the lavender jadeite is manganese. And all those are found uh, primarily in Burma, in Northern Burma. Jadeite itself can come in uh, very large sizes. This is the largest I've ever seen. Now this is gonna be very low quality jade. Uh, but still, you have to be impressed by the, the size of it at 200 tons. In fact, in Burma, the very lowest grade of jadeite is uh, crushed and used as road fill. So on the one hand, you have jadeite beads, which can bring a million dollars per bead. And on the other hand, you have the very lowest grade uh, white jadeite crushed and being used as, uh, you know, to build driveways and for road fill. More likely, this is the kind of rough jade we would encounter. This picture was taken at the, uh, the Rangoon Jade Auction, which is held uh, once or twice every year. And these are typically one, two, three, up to several pounds. Uh, cobbles that have been sliced in half. Now, the, the Chinese jade dealers love to gamble, and not all the cobbles are cut in half for your benefit, and you have to guess what's inside. Uh, sometimes a little window will be cut, and you can peer in a little bit to get some idea of what's inside the stone. But as they say, one cut and you're poor, another cut and you're rich. You never know what you're going to find inside of the cobble. In terms of uh, jade jewelry, here's a very nice example. This is not the very top of the line jadeite because it's so opaque. 
but it has very nice color. As the jadeite becomes more translucent, it becomes more valuable. Here's a very nice example set in a, uh, in a platinum ring. And another very translucent, excellent color. Uh, this is from uh, GIA, the picture. Again, this is what we're looking for. Uh, the most translucent and excellent green color. And in this case, you have the additional factor of trying to match everything. The very finest uh, jadeite looks like a drop of green oil. It's the closest thing to uh, describing it. I mentioned that jadeite also comes in uh, lavender. Here's two very nice examples. The one on the left did not sell, which is a, a little bit of a mystery. It's possible that people thought that the intense uh, lavender color might have been um, faked in some way. I'm not sure. I'm just guessing. Typically, once you get above about $50,000 on a piece of jadeite, you should be expecting a certificate to certify the, uh, the color. We'll talk a little bit later about um, how you guarantee the color on jadeite. Another nice uh, lavender example, this, this was sold at uh, Heritage Auctions. And more lavender. Lavender goes nicely with the green. So the combination of uh, green jadeite, lavender jadeite goes together very nicely. When we evaluate jadeite, uh, we look not just at the color and imperial, deep imperial green color is the ideal, but we also look at the texture. In other words, the, the fineness of the crystalline structure of the jadeite, the clarity that would be the lack of inclusions in the jadeite and the translucency. Now the translucency, when it gets to be extremely translucent, almost transparent, it becomes something we call icy jade. It's also called water jade. It's had a, a couple of other names over the years, uh, but icy jade is the current name. Here's some nice examples of it. And here's a very fine example of it. In fact, this example is so fine, you'd have to be careful not to confuse it with rock crystal. There's a tremendous difference in the, in the value between those two. And then a cousin of jadeite, uh, Merrill, if you're watching, that's your uh, piece in the upper left. This is Matsitsit. Matsitsit is very closely related to jadeite. Again, it's a rock. It's a mixture of a lot of different minerals, uh, including jadeite, but some other things as well. And it's found in only one tiny little region of uh, Burma. But let's move on to uh, some of the pseudo jades and treatments that goes on with jade. And jade really comes in for far more than its share of false jades and uh, dyed and treated jade. The most common that you'll run across for carvings is trying to imitate nephrite. And the most common among those will be serpentine and a very hard uh, variety of serpentine called bowenite. Here's some examples. And if you take a look at the two at the top, you'll see that the, aside from the kind of the sickly yellow green color, there's too much transparency in the material. Bowenite can be a real fooler. Uh, it'll pass some of the tests that we talk about, but it has a much lower density 
than nephrite. So after a while, you can just tell by hefting it uh, whether a piece is nephrite or bowenite. Chalcedony, which is um, microcrystalline quartz, um, can also imitate jade, as can Peking glass and crystalline quartz that has been dyed. Uh, I should mention that jade can be dyed. It, it takes dye very readily <clears throat> because of its compact uh, structure. And uh, both types of quartz, uh, crystalline and uh, microcrystalline, can also be dyed. And when crystalline quartz is dyed, it's called Malaysian jade. And here's some examples of it here, very deceptive. If you're buying by pictures alone, it's very easy to be taken in uh, by Malaysian jade. Well, serpentine is the biggest thing to defend against for imitating nephrite. Uh, it, it is much softer material, so a hardness test will distinguish it. And it is substantially lighter, uh, less dense than nephrite. So the heft in your hand can help uh, distinguish it. Again, the typical stuff that we see is much more transparent than nephrite. So it's pretty easy to distinguish it. The Malaysian jade, again, is much lower density. It, uh, it will fail uh, tests for density, but it will pass tests for hardness because quartz is actually slightly harder than either type of jade. So here again are some examples of um, the Malaysian jade. You can see the very low prices that this material brings. It's just dyed quartz. Here's the uh, hardness. Again, it's a little bit harder than jade, but substantially lower specific gravity. Chrysoprase is another form of um, chalcedony that can resemble jadeite. In the case of chalcedony, uh, also called Australian jade, uh, the color is off. There's a blue, a hint of blue mixed in with the green uh, that comes because the material is colored by nickel rather than chrome. And again, being a quartz material, the specific gravity will be lower. That's not to say that you can't make very nice jewelry out of these. Uh, here's uh, chrysoprase and gold uh, <laughs> at Cartier. Aventurine is another type of quartz that you might run across. And the thing that gives aventurine away is usually the a very fine inclusions of mica or some other mineral. And again, that's not to say these materials are worthless. Uh, here's a double strand of aventurine, uh, which brought a pretty good price at, uh, at Skinner's, but again, it's not jade and it's not selling for a jade price. Another material you're, you're not likely to run across, but I'll mention it because some very nice jewelry has been created with it is Californite. Uh, goes by a, a variety of other names you can see at the top. And it, and it's very, finest grades, it produces some beautiful jewelry. <clears throat> I mention it because not only is its hardness in the correct range for jadeite, but its specific gravity or density is also in the correct range for jadeite. So it can be tough to distinguish this. The refractive index is a, a little bit higher 
than uh, jadeites 1.66. But as you know, it's very hard to get accurate refractive index uh, readings on uh, curved cabochons. Another material worth mentioning, uh, you probably will not run across it, is ruby and zoisite. This uh, zoisite is the same stone, really, that uh, tanzanite comes from. Uh, but this particular material is opaque, and it has uh, ruby all threaded all through it. Again, the hardness and the specific gravity are, and in this case, the refractive index are all very close to jadeite, although I don't think anybody would confuse this with jadeite. Uh, glass is widely uh, used to imitate jade, in particular jadeite. And the specific gravity of uh, glass can vary all over the place depending on how much lead is, is in the uh, mixture. The hardness is a little bit less than, um, than jades, uh, not dependably so. And the refractive index, again, can vary all over the place depending on the particular glass mixture. The best defense against glass is to search for bubbles. You can see lots of bubbles in the glass in the example shown here. And really all it takes is one bubble, uh, courtesy of your 10 power loop, and that would rule it out as jade. So glass is obviously the, the cheapest of all the imitators, and it can do a a pretty good job if you don't get too close to it, close enough to see the bubbles in the glass. Here are some examples here. Uh, these are all glass imitating jadeite. Even the raw material um, is imitated by glass. Uh, an example here from Richard Hughes who found these on display in the marketplace in China. Uh, these are the, the raw cobbles with the outer skin supposedly removed, but in fact, they are all actually glass as revealed by that one bubble right there. And then finally, there's plastic. All that uh, jade dust that accumulates in the course of making carvings, uh, some of it gets thrown out, but some of it gets mixed in with epoxy resin to produce these objects, which I don't think are gonna fool anybody, but these are all made of jade dust in a uh, epoxy resin binder. Well, with all these fakes around, how are we going to detect them? And your best friend is your 10 power loop. The 10 power loop will help look for uh, bubbles, which even one bubble or a pit where a bubble has been uh, cut in half in the polishing process, uh, that would give it away right away as uh, glass. It can help look for dye. And um, I'll show you a close up example of a dyed uh, uh, piece of jade. The other defense is uh, hardness testing. Now, the right way to do it would be with a set of these hardness testing points. But an effective way to test is with a, a quality pocket knife which would have a hardness of about six, and it should not be able to um, nick or scratch nephrite or jadeite. Now, obviously you have to do this very carefully and with the, uh, with the permission of the owner of the piece, and you're not trying to put a big ugly scratch in the piece just to 
just feeling the point of the knife bite into the material tells you that it is probably softer than six and therefore probably not jade. A more definitive test is to measure the specific gravity or density. Uh, and for objects between about an ounce and a pound in weight, uh, one very nice way to do it is the so-called method of Archimedes, which was actually invented by Archimedes 2000 some years ago. And that is to measure the object in the air and then measure it while it's submerged in water and calculate the specific gravity uh, according to this formula. This is much more accurate than a hardness test, although the two together can help bracket whether you're dealing with jade or pseudo jade. For very small stones, we, we can't use the method of Archimedes, but we can use heavy liquids testing. Dropping the stone into a calibrated liquid of a uh, very dense specific gravity, uh, a complete set of heavy liquids testing would range from about 2.5 up to about 3.3 plus. And whether the stone sinks or floats or just very slowly descends tells you the specific gravity of the stone. Now I should point out that these heavy liquids are very toxic. So if you can find some other way to measure it, um, that would be preferable to using the heavy liquids testing. Now, jade can be dyed, as I pointed out, but in 1989, something uh, much more insidious uh, popped up, and that is the idea of polymer injected jadeite. Natural color jadeite is what we call type A. And the polymer injected jadeite is white jadeite, cheap white jadeite that has been uh, bleached of any remaining yellow or brown tones and then backfilled under pressure with a green polymer that turns it a nice uh, juicy color of green. This is what we call type B. <clears throat> when type B first appeared on the market back in uh, 89, sales of jadeite jewelry plunged about 50% until people could come up with some kind of method of detecting uh, this treatment. And I'll mention down here, type C is merely dyed jadeite. It has not had the, the bleaching and the backfilling under pressure of the polymer. Um, note also that these are called types. It's type A, type B, type C. It's not a grade. It's not a quality grade, but it's rather to uh, indicate what kind of treatment, if any, has been used on the material. Type A should have no treatment other than the uh, the long time traditional washing with uh, plum juice and polishing with uh, beeswax. Now for type C, here's, here are two ridiculous examples. I don't think anybody would be fooled by these garish colors, but this is merely white jadeite. It is true jadeite, but it has been dyed with these uh, insane colors. Harder to detect would be if it's dyed green. And here's where your loop comes into play again. The green will run along tiny fissures in the stone. And you can see that on the right. The type A natural color will appear as a, as a more blurred out zone. The very best way of detecting type B jadeite 
and kind of what we would expect for an expensive piece of jade is infrared spectrometry. Now an infrared spectrometer costs $100,000 and up and you have to be trained in its use. So it's, it's not the kind of uh, instrument everybody's gonna have and you might have to send it off to a lab such as GIA or uh, Mason K. And you would get a report back that looks either like this or like this. Here we're taking the red uh, curve as the item under test and comparing it to known type A and known type B. And here, the red item under test matches awful close to the known type B. And we would have to conclude that that's been treated with the uh, backfill of polymer. Whether it's been treated or not makes a huge difference, as you can see by these examples. On the left and in the upper right are true type A jadeite. And down here is a, uh, a cheapy uh, type B imitator. Again, $2 million necklace on the left and it's type C, this has only been dyed uh, jadeite copy. So this is probably Malaysian, Malaysian jade on the right. Lavender uh, also comes in for fakery. Uh, the example on the left has been dyed and uh, what gives it away in this case is the color is too bright. Real lavender jadeite looks something like these on the right. In fact, this one has a little bit of green uh, in the stone, which helps distinguish it. So let me wrap this up with um, a kind of a gallery of some real jadeite jewelry, just to kind of train the eye a little bit. These beads um, come from roughly 1900. They're jadeite. Uh, so we're talking about the very tail end of the uh, Qing dynasty. And this bead here, the central bead has been hollowed out through the tiny holes shown here. So the whole inside of the bead is hollow and this kind of lattice, open lattice work is carved on the outside of the bead. Here's some nice examples that show the very top color and clarity and translucency that can be achieved in uh, jadeite and also the kind of prices that that material is going to bring. Jade was uh, used a lot for high-end uh, art deco, it was very popular uh, with, with Cartier. And um, the Cartier was also famous for its uh, use of Asian motifs. So they go together very nicely. You see some nice examples here. Of course, right away, costume jewelry tried to imitate these, and that's where dyed quartz comes into play or, or glass equivalent. Two other nice examples. Uh, this is a, an object called a Buddha hand fruit in the center. This is, in, I believe this bracelet is now in Cartier's uh, archives. And a diamond ring with a very fine jadeite color on the right. A pendant showing a top grade jadeite color. And you notice this has a little door 
on the back. Uh, this Guanyin pendant, in, if, if it was a three-dimensional object, the little door on the back would have opened into a compartment to hold prayers that were uh, written on paper and stuffed in through the door. In this case, I think the door is probably so that people can shine a light through and see the, the beauty of the jadeite. And uh, jade is still being used by the very top jewelry uh, artists, luxury jewelry artists in Asia, and who are working in uh, contemporary designs as shown here. These are all examples done in the past several years, working in top grade Burmese jadeite. Some more examples, very nice uh, gentleman's ring on the right here. Wouldn't mind having that myself. And then finally, let me wrap this up with um, one that just I just became aware of this morning. And uh, you're all in luck because this is still available. Uh, this is not the Barbara Hutton necklace, but it's pretty close in quality. The beads are a little smaller, but there are a few extra beads compared to the Barbara Hutton necklace. And this will actually be coming up at auction a month from now uh, with this estimate, seven to $11 million. So you have one month to get your money together and get your bid in. You can actually own this piece. So that's a quick look at uh, Jade and uh, some of its imitators and how to defend against them. For uh, further information, you might wanna check out some of these books. These are all very easy to find. Uh, the Handbook of Jade gets into the mineralogy of it. The Collector's Book of Jade covers that and the, uh, the Chinese aspect of it particularly. Caverne's book ranges all over the world. And uh, Whitlock and Ehrman, even though that was published back in the 40s, is still available uh, reasonably priced. You can check out my own website and you can check out Friends of Jade 2.0 on Facebook. And uh, uh, finally, I'll mention uh, the book that uh, Melanie mentioned right at the very beginning that should be coming out this month, although this month is, is disappearing quickly. This is about a uh, five to 600 page book on jade from all over the world, uh, written that each chapter is written by a specialist in that particular type of jade or that area where that jade comes from. Uh, I've co-authored uh, two of the two of the chapters, but there must be about twenty or so different authors that created this book. And this is my own uh, website. If you want to have a look there, all of the books I've mentioned, except for the very last one that hasn't come out yet, are available uh, on that site. The next question is. Um... It was heard that there were fake jadeite ruffs in Burma recently. Um, they stuck a piece of green jade as a window to con people. That's and correct. Like the little boulders in the little. The, uh, I didn't show. I didn't show one with the window. I should actually add that to the lecture. <clears throat> but they were taking um, white jadeite cobbles with the skin still on and cutting a window into it. And of course, with that window, you would see white. So nobody would buy it. Uh, but then they were dyeing the white through the window. So only the window was a nice green, but the inside of the stone was the same stuff you want to crush and, you know, build driveways with. <clears throat> 